Hello. 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 Yes. <laughs> I have no choice. I have to do this solo. <laughs> so, um, yeah, bizarre sporting events in Sussex history. As a historian, I've gone through loads of old newspapers um, for research, but I'm also a very keen runner, and uh, I kept getting distracted looking at the clippings of old athletics events and cross-country races. And the more I looked into it, the more weird and wonderful sporting events I found in Sussex history. And I'm going to share a few of those with you tonight. Uh, I'm going to firstly look at some of the, um, what, what you call the more usual sports, and uh, the crazy stuff that went on there. Then I'm going to take you into the bizarre world of village sports days of the past. So, horse racing obviously has been around for a long, long time. This is George Fordham, jockey. I mean, we think jockeys are small now, but uh, I've got, we've got a massive horse. Um, there you go. So George married a Lewis girl, and uh, he moved to Brighton, and you can see him on the, the race courses in the 1860s and 70s. But long, long before the Brighton race course, there was the Lewis race course. Now Lewis was also the county town, still is. And um, so they had the Assizes there. The Assizes are the really big, serious court cases uh, that they would save up, and every few months, judges specially chosen from around the country would come and preside over these court cases. And what they decided to do in the 1720s was to combine the race weekend with the Assizes, so the judges could basically, you know, sentence someone to death and then go and watch the racing. Now, I've got a, clip, a clipping here from 1756, as you can see at the top there, the later sizes, which ended on Wednesday last, there was not one prisoner to try. So they actually came down to Lewis for the horse racing, let's face it. And uh, on Friday, uh, you can see the King's Plate was run on our downs when only one horse started. So they're actually watching a one horse race. That must have been riveting that Friday. They did have a race on the Saturday where more than one horse raced. And at the bottom there, uh, just like a footnote, it says we hear that one day last week Sir Thomas Dyke died. So basically what this, what this clipping is showing um, is that um, there were some assizes, some court cases, but there wasn't any. Uh, one of their colleagues had sadly died, um, but the main thing is here, as you can see, is the horse racing. That's what it was all about. <clears throat> now, however much you try and tart cricket up, it has a tendency to be extremely dull. Now, um, this, this chap here, either he's just posing for the photographer or the field or something bothered to show up. Um, but uh, there he is, that's our, our cricketer. Now there's a couple here, these are sort of well-known cricketers of their day. On the left you've got Harry Baldwin, who is having to hold his trousers up just to have his photograph taken. Um, so how on earth did he bowl? I mean, by the time he got to the crease, his trousers would be round his ankles. But mind you, maybe that's why he was such a good bowler because the visiting batsman would just be so confused at a slightly chubby bloke running towards him with his trousers around his ankles and forget to swing. Um, and W.G. Grace, um, still playing professionally in his 50s there, uh, but I can't imagine the Australians being very uh, scared about that bloke ambling towards them. But the, Austra uh, the Australians, no, the Victorians knew that uh, cricket was dull and they tried to perk it up. Um, just to let you know, I am going to be showing quite a few little clippings up here. I know the tendency is just to read them, but I will point out the, uh, the funny or important bits. Um, it's mainly up there, so you know I'm not making all this up. Um, but this is clown cricket. So, um, you know, cricket in your town or village is becoming a bit dull, so you phone up George Webb of Tavistock Street, Covent Garden. Uh, well, you wouldn't phone him, it's 1870, but you'd write to him. Um, <laughs> you could try. And uh, he'd send some clowns down to play for you, so you entertain the crowds. And um, so what they'd have, they'd, they'd have a group of clowns. Within them, there'll be two or three proper cricketers who could actually play, but they'd still be made up as clowns. And they'd go round. And you can see there that um, uh, they'll be playing at Lewis on the 28th and 29th of April, 1870. Then they're off to Gravesend. And they'd come down in the, uh, a wagon and, you know, amongst all this uh, pomp and uh, they come through Lewis High Street and uh, then they would meet a local cricket team and play against them. And so the bowlers, for instance, dressed as clowns, would, as they were running up, they'd do a somersault before they bowled, 
And, um, you know, when something went for a six, or when they were changing batsmen, they'd do acrobatics and all sorts of stuff, just to entertain the crowd. And you can see there, good cricket with fun, which is how I think cricket should be. Um, I mean, maybe the England team should just have a go at the next Ashes, uh, dress up as clowns, because at least it will be good cricket with fun at that point. Um, I think ITV might have to take that on, because I'm not sure the BBC would go for that one. Um, I've had to put this in, although it's outside Sussex, but this is an annual cricket match where they pitched 11 one-armed men against 11 one-legged men. <laughs> this is on Blackheath. And, uh, I mean, thousands and thousands of people would turn up every year to watch this match. Um, and it was the pensioners of Greenwich Hospital competing, and uh, all good fun. And, uh, as you can see here, the one-legged men played best, but the one-armed men ran best. <laughs> so, yeah. The Georgians, the Victorians, they knew how to perk cricket up. Much needed, I think. So, as I say, I am a runner, and uh, so I'm going to throw a few running uh, clippings and photographs in. This is a shrub. This is uh, Alf Alfred Shrub. Um, he was a Horsham man, West Sussex. And uh, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you here have done a race, whether it's a 5k race or a marathon. You, you get a, you know, you get a, a medal that you can put around your neck. You couldn't put any of these things around your neck. I mean, absolutely unbelievable what he's got. And they're not just cups. He's got, no, he's got a, a standing clock here. He's got an oil lamp, more clocks, um, some sort of condiment trays, and a host of cutlery. I think that's what you call a group of cutlery, a host. And he's got loads of it. So um, that's what you do when you go for a cross-country race. You come back with a, you know, case of cutlery. Um, Tom Mantell, who was also running at the same time, he once won a drinks cabinet for running five miles. Uh, we don't get that now. I mean, I've, I've run cross-country races and don't get anything like that. Now, again, they like to shake things up in the old days. This is Lewis in 1908. And uh, on the left, uh, we have J.G. Cox who is a Lewis runner, and on the right we have George Lana, who was a self-styled world champion walker. And so they pitched the two together, and, uh, or against each other, and uh, the walker would have to walk three miles, and the runner would run four miles, and they'd start off at the same time and see who won. And in this instance, uh, the walker won only by a few yards. And again, loads of people come down to watch it, and those two men look absolutely terrified, I don't know why. And I think they're also the only two people not smoking a fag, which is how you can, um, you can guess who the, uh, the athletes are. But it wasn't just walking versus running, no. Fred Pettit was an expert hopper. He used to hop against runners. And uh, you can see here that uh, Fred Pettit should hop 55 yards while Albert Banks should run 100 yards. So he used to go around, this is at Seaford in 1878, Again, hundreds of people come and watch and see Fred hopping against athletes. <laughs> I've got to put a little bit of football in. Um, I'm quite a good runner, but I'm not a very good footballer. But even I know that that is no good for dribbling the ball. Um, cadence is all wrong, his legs are far too wide, very difficult for speed to turn over. And if you hold your hands in the air when you're running, you lose your balance, you're likely to fall over. Um, rubbish, that is, that stance. I don't know if um, these ladies were actually fans, or um, maybe not, but I digress. Again, this is Lewis, 1921. You can tell I'm from Lewis, there's a lot of Lewis stuff in here. Uh, we've got, uh, this is a charity football match, and we've got, looks like an old maid here, a Scotchman, uh, Red Cross nurse, clown, all sorts of things. Uh, this is the Lewis Police Force. And uh, every year they would have a charity match against the Lewis Tradesmen. And um, I've got here, I've got a list somewhere, I've got a list of the competitors for the following year. I don't have a photograph. Um, but there were 3,000 people came to watch the 1922 version. And the report in the newspaper uh, said there was a clown, fry tuck, a smuggler, a teddy bear, a professional buffoon, a female jester, and P.C. Askew dressed as a Chinaman. And they had, they had um, three K-1 
current Arsenal players to come and uh, referee and line the match. Um, and within minutes, they realised they didn't have any jurisdiction, so they actually joined in the game. Uh, at one point, the chap dressed as Fry Tuck collapsed and uh, he fell to the ground uh, after knocking his head. And uh, some people, according to this, is in the report in the newspaper, the Sussex Express, the, um, some men ran, ran, ran onto the field and uh, they fed him a black liquid. And uh, Fry Tuck immediately jumped up, ran the length of the pitch, shook hands with the opposition goal, and then fell asleep in the nets. And in the newspaper, this, a week later, they're still not sure whether it was part of the, the fun or whether he was generally concussed. And at another point, a little boy nicked the ball and ran across the fields with him, chased by people dressed like this. It must have been, uh, must have been quite a sight, really. Now, I can't talk about Sussex sports without mentioning stall ball. Yes, hooray, yes. Now, there's going to be some people in this room. Can we have a show of hands who has not heard of stall ball? Look at that. And you weren't, you didn't grow up in Sussex, so I will pretty much guarantee it. Because if you did, you'd know what stall ball is. It's one of those things, like Twittons. I grew up knowing about Twittons and stall ball, and you talk to someone outside Sussex, and they have no idea what you're talking about. Um, for those who don't know, um, stall ball is, it was known as cricket in the air. As you can see here, you've got a, um, a wooden bat with a, quite a long handle, you've got a board there, which is your wicket, and you bowl underarm. And it was known as cricket in the air, as I say. And way back in 1450, a pamphlet was produced for parish priests, priests asking them not to play stall ball on a Sunday in graveyards. Because you could literally play it, play it anywhere, because you didn't need a, a level playing field. And also, uh, you, could, it, you didn't need, it's not like uh, cricket, football, rugby, you could actually, anyone could play it of any sort of ability. And that's actually demonstrated by Sir William Bull MP here. Short, old, bow-legged, ill-dressed for the occasion. Um, and I would say that was a beer gap, but that's probably more port and pheasant for a, um, an MP in the 1920s. And he was the captain of the team as well, so uh, well, there you go. Uh, this is another classic stall ball picture. Uh, this lady has kept the fox around her neck for, this, uh, for the batting. There's some Welsh children in the background. There's a nurse with a rifle, or possibly a big stick. <laughs> and a huge chap with a hat in the background. That's just an average stall ball, mate. You don't know what you're missing if you haven't played stall ball. <laughs> this, actually, this is at Cheney in 1921. This is the Prime Minister's wife. That's Mrs Lloyd George. So I assume these children are just normal children, not Welsh. And uh, they've been dressed up as Welsh children just to appease, to appease them there. Thirst, 1919. An exciting match was played on Friday evening between the Ticehurst Women's Institute Club and the Ticehurst Cricket Club. The men played left-handed. Both teams scored 32 runs, but the Institute team won, owing to one of the opposing team touching the ball with the right hand, so it gave an extra run to the ladies. Now, this is obviously what you have to do if you're pitching a, a group of men against a group of women uh, in a sport, you have to handicap the men as they have here, or else it won't be an even game and it's not very good for spectators or for the competitors. So they all play left-handed. However, the Elfriston girls didn't like that. It says here, generally when women and men are opposed in team games, it's found necessary to handicap the men so that an even game will result. But not at all Friston, where the local Storble Club met a men's team on level terms. No left-handed restrictions about batting or bowling or anything like that. And what happens? Well, the women won comfortably. Congratulations. <laughs> Can happen. Now this takes me on to the second half of my talk, which is the wonderful world of sports days. Here we are at Hawkehurst in 1950. This is the East Sussex and West Kent sub-area sports day events. And uh, they didn't fit all that in the poster, I don't think. Um, in the results leaflet, this man here is known as Gorgeous Freddy. And this is actually the, um, uh, it's the veterans race. And they said he looked so young, they're not sure how he snuck into the vets race. But as you can see, he came third anyway, so I don't think it really mattered. But, Sports days have been going on for a long, long time. This is Brighton back in 1823, nearly 200 years ago. We got donkey races, jumping in sacks, 
and jingling matches. Anybody here heard of jingling matches? No, you see, they stopped over a hundred years ago. Not sure why, I should bring them back. What would happen, they'd get a chap and they'd tie bells to his arms and legs. Uh, they'd tie his hands behind his back and send him into a field. And after him, they'd send a dozen blindfolded men to chase him down. So he was the jingler. And so if any of the men caught the jingler, they would then become the jingler. And it was sort of a 20 minute match. And whoever was the jingler at the end uh, would, uh, would be the winner. And it varied across the country. Sometimes the jingler didn't have his hands to hide behind his back. Uh, and he was able, uh, they would put little bales of hay in the field and he was able to throw them at these advancing blindfolded men. <laughs> <laughs> so we also had climbing the pole, um, foot races, gowns, bodies. See all these um, prizes, saddles, legs and shoulders and mutton, hats and jackets, very much practical prizes in those days, you see. Uh, this is eight years later and uh, yeah, like we had before, climbing a pole for a leg of mutton. Now this is the greasy pole. So it was a, it was a straight pole, um, about 12 feet high, and there'd be a prize on the top. Leg of mutton, a hat or whatever. And basically if you got the prize, it was yours. And um, quite a dangerous one to do, because you could be about, you know, nearly at the top, or at the top, slip, fall down. So there were a few sort of twisted ankles and, and such, and maybe worse actually. There's another interesting one here, catching a cock. Um, if you've seen um, the Rocky film, Mickey, his trainer, gets him to run around in a farmyard trying to catch a hen, really, really difficult. Well, in this, catching a cock with hands tied behind. I have no idea how that, that would work. Again, wheeling a barrow, hoodwink, just, just absolutely obsessed with blindfolding or tying hands behind competitors' backs. And uh, here we got jingling for a hat. We've all done that. <laughs> so here we are. This is the horizontal version of the greasy pole. You can see two men here smacking each other about. Um, they've got a sort of sack filled with sand or something similar um, suspended over the water there. Well, I mean, this chap here, um, I think he's lost really, hasn't he? He's long since lost his sack down the bottom there. And uh, this bloke's now got free reign, much to the delight of him and the audience. Uh, this is at Seaford in 1919, and this was at the peace celebrations. And in 1919, there were many around in the summer of that year, peace celebrations. And what better way to celebrate peace than to smack one of your fellow townsmen around the head and body with a sack full of sand until he falls into a pit of cold water. I had to put this in. I know it's the Isle of Wight and not Sussex, but it, was, it shows you how dangerous these were, these greasy poles. Uh, the tide was an exceptionally low ebb, and Mr. C. Moses, a competitor, and falling off the greasy pole, struck his head on the seabed and was semi-conscious and managed to keep above water until the arrival of a rowboat. So not only was the greasy pole dangerous, but at Shanklin in 1934, they decided to have it out at sea. But it was so far out at sea that when someone fell in, they had to get a boat and go and rescue him. Uh, unbelievable. I assume people were sitting on the beach sort of looking perhaps with binoculars to see a man trying to get a a leg of mutton off the top of a pole in the middle of the sea. Ridiculous. You know, no health and safety in those days. Has anyone done piano bashing? Piano? No. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Um, 1960s and 70s, this is quite big piano bashing. Um, I, remember, I mean, my grandparents in the 1970s had a piano that no one played, and there were houses all over the country that had upright pianos that people just didn't play. So uh, they donated them to, um, to sporting events and men like this smashed them up for you. What you'd have is a, is a really big, we could try it, there's a piano there. Um, what you'd have is a really big box um, with a sort of letter box shaped hole in, or in this case, what you've got is this tall um, board here, and there's a box on the other side, and there's again a letter box shape here, and the idea was to get the piano in the box. So you had to smash it up uh, with hammers and mallets and get these bits as small as possible and it was the first team to get their piano in the box. Uh, this chap here got these shorts, but uh, in those days he just got on with it, didn't he? <laughs> I am going to leave you with my favourite of all the sports day events and that's the menagerie race. 
So if you don't fancy running yourself, you bring your pet and let them run for you. Um, this, I'm going to give you 10 seconds to have a look at the entrance to this particular menagerie race. So which, which animal do you reckon would be the best? Now, considering this is running in a straight line uh, for 300 yards. Hedgehog, hey, someone's just said down there, ridiculous. It's actually the bantams. Because if you get if you get a hen and put it on the ground and give it a shove, it'll probably just go around. If you get your cat and put it on the start line of a 300 yard race, it's probably not going to be too interested. Um, so uh, yeah, bring your bantam basically. That was the order of the day. Um, here's an artist's impression of the menagerie race. This is in Singapore in 1881. Like many sports day events. Um, especially in the Victorian period, they started as military events. And so that's what you've got here. I can imagine these guys in Singapore the night before, in the, you know, a bit drunk, maybe in the barracks, just saying, hey, let's race our pets. And the next day they did. So, you know, this Jack, his pet monkey and him are having a bit of a tug of war. Um, if you've ever tried to move a goat that doesn't want to be moved, I mean, you're going to lose there. Uh, this chap's got his pelican up in a tree. He's quite happy. Uh, dog and a pig fighting, all sorts of stuff going on. And as cruel as it are, oh, this chap very, very gently trying to coax his frog. Um, and although it may seem a bit cruel, it's nice to know that the animals are clearly winning the Battle of Wills, I think, on this one. But the best village of all, of the whole country, for actually doing these menagerie races was Barkham, which is a small village just north of Lewis. And here's a clipping from 1889, and it's, it's a handicap race, 300 yards. And you can see that Popart's dog won, second was a dog led by Chatfield, third was a cat driven by McCarthy, and there Sir William Grantham piloted a turkey. <laughs> so I'd love to see an artist's impression of all that lot. And you can see here that the cats and rats are given a 100-yard head start, and uh, if you do have to have a guinea fowl, that's got 250-yard start, so there were, there were various things there. But uh, again, Barkham again, every year they had these, these amazing races, and uh, four years later, look, someone's entered a wasp. <laughs> you can imagine that. Imagine the conversation at home. Dad, it's a menagerie race. Should we, should we bring our spaniel? No, 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 don't worry, son. I've got a wasp upstairs. I've been training it. It's a winner. So, all of these, whether it's the stall ball, the clown cricket, the jingling matches, the piano bashing, whatever it is, it's all about pure enjoyment. Enjoyment for the spectators and the enjoyment for the contestants. And um, that's actually demonstrated by Molly and Daphne here in 1950 at Hawkehurst. I have never seen someone that happy to be doing a sporting event. Thanks. But uh, so at this point in Barbara, after the talks, anyone can ask any questions that they wish to of, uh, of the Bavada. So has anybody got any questions? I mean, bring back jingling would be my first sort of statement. Yes, we should all be jingling. But uh, has anybody got anything to ask of, uh, of our first Bavada this evening? Anything that has... Uh, sorry, I can't say. Yes, yes. So I just noticed one of the sports uh, was goose cutting. Can you help us know what that was? <laughs> yes, there was goose cutting. There were... Another, if I had a longer version of this talk, there are lots and lots of sort of evocative names for, um, for sports. Goose cutting is one. Um, cleaving the Turk's head is another. And I always wondered about that. It's something that went, it was originally military, but someone's told me that it, a Turk's head was also um, a knot used in sailing. And I think it's very much like the, cutting the goose's head. It's not an actual goose, like it's not an actual Turk's head. And I think it's uh, an event involved with a knife or something. It's cutting through a rope or something similar as quick as you can. But yes. Uh -huh. Thank you. Yes, at the back, yeah. Um, have you put in any of this information uh, 
I did actually do this talk for um, the Catalyst Club. So can you repeat the question? So I oh, sorry. Answer. Yeah, someone asked um, um, if I'd actually put this together in any sort of book or article or something. Um, and I did a talk for the Catalyst Club, this one last year. And a chap was in the audience who wrote an online magazine and asked me if I could actually um, do, do a version. So if you go onto my website, um, I've got loads of flyers around here. There is a link to that talk, under talks, um, there's a link to that actual um, um, article that I wrote uh, for Eurogamer. Um, but that's all I've done so far. I'm basically, I'm a genealogist by trade, so I'm so busy sort of doing my normal job that this a lovely sideline as it is, I really wish I had time to write about it, but maybe I will. Any, any, more, any more questions? Yes, see. Um, in the Menagerie races, uh, was there any, as in a case where one of the contestants was eaten by one of the other contestants? Because <laughs> I couldn't help noticing with the line up there, there were a few things a cat would take into shape. Oh yeah, so, uh, you, so right, asking if anyone's eaten anybody else in the Menagerie races. Well actually, um, there were, at Windmill Hill, in the 1920s, there was a complete, there was a stipulation that there were to be no dogs and cats. Now I assume it's because they were sped up with the fighting, but in the lineup for that year, there was a fox and a pheasant. <laughs> so um, they didn't really get that right. But no, I know exactly what you mean. Um, uh, yeah, uh, there was always, it was always seen as the fun thing at the end of sports day, and it always caused much hilarity. Um, I, yeah, I expect there were a few. Some probably ate that wasp. Any more questions for, for, for this side? So, so any more, any more, any more? In which case, if there are no more questions, what we'll do, we'll, we'll stop and take a break. Before we do that, I just should tell you that, uh, can, we, can we thank Matt? Ye